Let me open in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your presence here with us. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that uh, you would lead and guide me and uh, that you would not allow me to speak um, from myself, but uh, that it, my words would be from you and that would be glorifying to you. Uh, Father, we thank you for Jesus and him crucified, risen, and seated at the right hand of the Father. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So I was asked to give my story today. Um, it's not my story. It's not my testimony. It's not my salvation. It's God's. Uh, the scripture says salvation is God's. Um, it's, it's about us um, in a sense, but even our salvation um, is, is God's. Um, it wasn't my plan to be saved. It wasn't your plan. It, it was uh, even to be born. We didn't even choose to be born. You didn't choose your parents. Uh, before the foundation of the world, uh, you were planned and not to be born and uh, saved if you know Christ today. And so I would like to start with uh, um, a passage from Romans chapter 5. For when we were still without strength, <clears throat> in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is everyone's testimony. Now, we all have different ways that God drew us to himself. Um, we all have a different story, but we all have the same testimony. In a sense. That is exactly this. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. That's her testimony. We were, we were sinners. We were far from God. We were born in sin. We were born with Adam's sin nature. And we are in desperate need for reconciliation with God. The scripture says, be reconciled to God. And so, everyone's uh, testimony is the same. Now, for my story... My story began, well, first of all, I was born in bed. Uh, not, not everybody is born in bed. My dad was born on a kitchen table. Um, but um, my grandfather was a United Church minister uh, back in the day when there were many United Church ministers um, that were evangelical, um, believed in the inerrancy of the Bible. and. He had such an impact on me. He was preaching in churches in the late 1920s and 30s and 40s, and he retired in, in 1950. And I have all his diaries all through the 50s, and he, um, he did nothing but pastoral care until he died. And it's no mistake that I'm the care pastor for Richview Baptist Church. It's, that's my heart. That was his heart. Um, it, that, was his, um, that was his heart all through ministry. Um, my mother used to tell me he was not really a great preacher. But a wonderful pastor. He had such an impact on me that when he died, when I was only eight years old, it was um, very difficult for me. My family, after he was buried, my family moved on, and I didn't. 
I was still grieving so hard. And when you're grieving a loved one, the best thing is to talk. Talk about your loved one, how that person had an impact on you, how you miss that person. It's, it's a healing process. I, and I didn't have that. Nobody wanted to talk about them. And so I reverted to my pillow at night and God. As a little eight-year-old, I would ask God to look after my grandfather in heaven. That's a child's prayer. But it was intimate. And he was my friend. And I would cry myself to sleep, missing my grandfather. And so there was a childlike faith, but it went away. I was growing up as a teenager in the 1960s. And for you uh, who remember that, I think we all, most of us here do, it was a time of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and I fell into it. In fact, the Beatles were my gods and I adapted into or adopted into their philosophy in life, especially John Lennon. He was an atheist and I became an atheist. John Lennon's um, whole concept was God is a concept in which we measure our pain. I mean, what, what a silly thing to say. Um, on one of his solo albums, he says, I don't believe in Jesus. And so I followed his philosophy in life. My life then took on, huh, I lived as though there was no God. And if you're wondering what has happened to the moral fabric of our society today, I believe that's what's happening. People are living as though there is no God. By the time I was 23, I was an alcoholic and on drugs. I say that to my shame. When I was 20 years old, I started working as a casket maker. Not a gasket maker, a casket maker. <laughs> as in underground novelties. So that, and I was in that uh, profession for years. And so, um, when I go to visitation at a funeral home, first thing I'm writing uh, my name in a guest book, one eye in the guest book and the other eye on a casket. Uh, um, I can't help myself. Um, and so it, it was a very interesting pro profession and a good living and that. Um, but um, I got sick. I got sick years later and I had to stop working but in the in the um, in in the 70s it was a very difficult time for me the, the cults were after me the Mormons were coming to my apartment for a couple of months Harry Krishna was after me Church of Scientology was after me I mean I was bombarded come on one afternoon in about the mid-70s, I, I was so sick of it all. And I thought to myself, I'd like to be a Christian. And then the next thought was, I'm not good enough. And how wrong that was, I learned years later, of course, that is wrong. Jesus Christ came to uh, save sinners. Um, but uh, at that time, there was no one to explain that to me. And so the thought just left. About three years later, one night God in my apartment, I was a bachelor, and God made it very known to me how wretched I was. I was never so aware of my sin as that particular night. And I knew that I would be going to hell if I was to die right then. And it terrified me. 
For the next few weeks, I had questions. In fact, I was open for the first time since I was a child to the possibility that God existed. Two weeks later, came home from our cottage on Labor Day evening, turned on the television, and remember that's when you had to stand there and wait for the picture to come on and see what uh, channel was. And right then, Billy Graham was walking up to the podium. Now, up to that time, I hated Billy Graham. I had seen him before. I hated his message, and I hated the people that would come forward uh, from the altar call. I saw them as steers um, c coming, following each other to the slaughter. That's how I saw them. I had so much hate in me. Not that night. I said out loud, all alone, he has the answers to my questions that I've been wondering about. And I sat down, listening. God gave me ears to hear and eyes to see that night. Billy was preaching from, of course, faithfully, from John, John 3. And I needed to hear that night, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. I've heard that for thousands of times, and it never gets old. He preached from John 14, um, preaching about heaven, and Thomas questioning on, uh, about it. How can we know the way? And Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's what I needed to hear, and that sealed the deal for me that night. So Billy gave the altar call, and not the steers, but the people were emptying their seats, coming forward, and I thought, oh, I'm emptying them if I could only be there. And then Billy's old buddy, Cliff Barrows, said over the air, and you too, right where you are, you can receive Jesus Christ. And I, I turned the TV off, and I sat there contemplating, because, see, I was the guy that if you knew me, you wouldn't speak of Jesus. I would tear a strip off you. You would hear from me. And so I, I had to think things over. What would people say? They probably wouldn't believe me. And my family would think, oh, well, this is just a phase, because that's the type of person I was. I was from one thing to another. And it's good to count the cost. But I made up my mind, if I'm going to go into my bedroom to my knees, there'll be no going back. No turning back. Eventually I got up and I went to my knees in my room. And a miraculous thing happened within me. It was the same God that I was talking to when I was a little child. You see, I'd gone away, far, far away. God didn't. He was still the compassionate father that I had talked to. He was still that comforter, the one willing to listen and love me tenderly. I was still that little boy I repented of my sins and received Christ. And I got up forgiven and went back to my couch. And I didn't understand everything. I wasn't a theologian. I still am not. But I knew one thing. Life would never be the same for Rick Lind. But all oh, life has been peaks and valleys, of course. But life has not been the same. Jesus Christ, the hope of glory, has been my walk. Pastoral care came about uh, 12 years ago. It was given to me. I was an elder at our church, and Pastor Dash left, and they said, well, Rick, you're already doing it, so take over. 
because I've always done it, every church, uh, with the, not officially. But um, all those years from the time I was saved, God brought infirmities to me, sickness, um, chronic fatigue syndrome hit me hard. And I still have issues with it. Um, I can just forget how to walk till this day out of nowhere. I can lose my energy within 20 seconds from 80% to 15%. I have to lie down every day. Um, I've had a breakdown, hospitalized in the psych ward, had anxiety issues. I told you about alcoholism. I brought people to AA. And so why I'm telling you this is it was all preparing me to be able to sit in front of someone and say, I get you. Been there. I understand. It hasn't been easy being um, in pastoral care. Um, sometimes it's been very joyful. Some of the hospital visits i I come away being ministered to uh, myself, um, and it's just been some very joyous visits, and um, even visiting people in their homes and counseling them. But there's been some drastic times too, um, some really um, very sad deaths that I've had to walk people uh, through afterwards for many, many months. Um, one I preached at and it was devastating, just devastating. But um, it's just so, uh, my, my father was a, um, a funeral director and that's why I ended up making caskets, you know, kept it in the family. But I asked my dad one time, what was the most rewarding thing about being a funeral director? And he said, I got to help people in the worst time of their life. And he said that was gratifying. And I, I suppose that's why pastoral care is gratifying for me. Because sometimes I have been there for people during the worst time of their life. And... Um, you could, my wife will tell you that um, sometimes um, I can't leave it at the office. Um, uh, it, it comes home with me, um, and uh, it, it does affect you. You can't love and not be affected. Um, and so, in closing, I just want to... Uh, I just want to remind you that we need to be reconciled with God. And if you're not right with God, just know that the door is open. You know, Jesus, when he preached to people, he said, come, come as you are. When he was feeding the 5,000, he gave them food. He, he created food out of, as you know, loaves and fish. He didn't hand out a suit and tie to the men and a Baptist dress to the women so that they would look the, the part, so that they would look like they had it all together. I thought that Sunday afternoon I had to have it all together to become a Christian. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's our Jesus. His death on the cross opened the door for us. 
the curtain was torn. Uh, the Holy of Holies is, is open for us personally. And um, just like that night, I was able to approach God and he was there. And it was only because of the blood of Jesus. And so I'm so grateful to be a Christian. There's some perks. Got to know Don Dearlove. (laughs) Let me pray for you. Our Heavenly Father, I give you thanks and praise for this church family. And I pray, Heavenly Father, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless them, O Lord, in your holy name. Amen.